Hello everyone, I'm Professor Paul Carrier of Western Michigan University Thomas M. Cooley Law School and I'm here to give you some background on the materials for Class 5 in Contracts 1. With Class 5 we begin considering one of the components of formation, which is consideration. We've already done offer, we've already done acceptance, now we're on the third important requirement or component, which is consideration. And the idea behind consideration is that when you have two or more parties to an agreement, each side has to do something, has to provide something, has to have some skin in the game. If you paint my garage, you want to be paid. If I sell you my motorcycle, I want some cash. And there are certain situations where it's questionable. For example, I might want to sell you my antique car for a very low price. And what I'm really doing is evading taxes. And it would be really more of a gift than a contract. And consideration is the thing that answers whether or not it's a legitimate bargain, a bargain for exchange, or whether it is something else which could cause other problems. It could even be a bribe. I could sell you my house for three dollars and something would not be copacetic about that. And so consideration shows us that parties have their intent and it's basically an evidentiary uh, mechanism to prove that there's a current intent to sell it now because I give this up but I am getting something in return from you. And you look at those uh, issues or you look at the facts surrounding it and then if it looks fine you move forward, if it doesn't look fine you've got to take a good look at whether or not consideration is adequate. Uh, there's a Latin term that's used very often, it's quid pro quo, or the something for something. And so what you'd say is each party gives something up. It is his or her quid pro quo for the other part of the bargain. I pay you $3,000, that's my quid pro quo. You paint my garage in a competent manner, that is your quid pro quo. Uh, what is consideration as an object? It could be many things. Cash is great. Uh, any form of payment, services, even giving up a legal claim or giving up a legal right. If I had the right to sue you, for example, and you wanted to pay me not to do that, then if I gave up that right, that would be valid consideration under the law. Perhaps the one of the most important but subtle issues with regard to consideration, I would say along with consideration substitutes, which we will cover later, uh, is the question of whether consideration is sufficient because it asks a particular question, a qualitative question. Is this the kind of thing that the law will recognize as legally sufficient consideration? And it goes to the nature of the thing. A tennis ball, uh, a, 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 an amount of services, a cash payment, a promise to pay in the future over a monthly for 60 months, example, for example. All of those if they're paired with the right kind of quid pro quo on the other side, would be valid legal consideration. And that goes to the issue of sufficiency. And the rule is, typically, if there is legal consideration on one side or on both sides, then the courts don't look any further, for example, to the relative values of consideration. In cases, however, that look like gifts, that look like bribes, that look like something other than a true contractual relationship, where there is a great disparity in the different values on each side, the courts may ask the question of adequacy, and that is quantitative. If I give you a tennis ball for $3, that would be legally sufficient on both sides. If I give you a tennis ball for your $3 million estate, that is so fishy, that is so disparate in value that the courts might look into the adequacy question to see whether or not it's not a contract but it's a gift or it's some other uh, mechanism, legal mechanism that would be subject to other rules. Okay? Uh, I would finalize today's material as a prequel talking about the Restatement Second of Contracts, Section 87 Sub 2, which is the option contract. And we talked about option contracts before in the common law when somebody in a unilateral contract begins performance. That person should have an option to be able to finish, which would take away the offeror's power to revoke. That was 87 section, subsection 1 of the Restatement Second on Contracts. Subsection 2 is different. What subsection 2 says is, if some party induces another to act on the basis or idea of a contract, and that party does in fact begin to act, 
detrimentally relying on the first party's representations. Then an option should be created based on that detrimental reliance, giving the party who began some performance the time to finish. So in other words, detrimental reliance, in this case, acts as a consideration substitute. And it typically will show up in a scenario where there's a unilateral contract, I want you to paint my garage, you begin painting, and for some reason I try to throw you off the job. Okay? Um, the idea of uh, what consideration does and what function it serves is, as mentioned a little earlier, significantly evidentiary. Did these parties intend to enter into an agreement knowingly, voluntarily, and are both giving up something of appropriate value, at least legally sufficient, from one side to the other. Uh, okay, uh, with regard to the uh, restatement second, uh, section 71, uh, subsection one we talked about earlier, uh, but subsection two is, I'd like you to use the terminology consideration substitute. So in the case of a unilateral contract, the ability to lock it in for a reasonable time and not allow the offer or to revoke the offer would, would act as a, as, a, as a placeholder for consideration. The consideration I might have demanded from you is painting the garage, okay? And you haven't finished that yet before I try to throw you off the job. What this would do is take the detrimental reliance of you beginning the job, believing that I would finish in good faith and pay you and it would hold until you were done and had the chance to fulfill your side of the bargain, your quid pro quo, the ultimate painting of, of the garage. Again, what does represent, what are examples of things that are appropriate consideration? A promise. If I promise to pay you in six monthly installments, you can sue me on that promise. That is legally sufficient. An act, if I paint your garage, for example, uh, that would be sufficient uh, consideration from a legal perspective. Forbearance, if you give up a legal right or you even give up a legal claim, then those are different. Those uh, are seen as legally sufficient. Uh, with regard to the legal claim, the creation, modification, or destruction of a legal claim or a legal relation is enough. Uh, okay, now for the case highlights. Uh, Hamer versus Sidway, the first case, the primary issue with regard to that is whether the giving up of a legal right, in this case it's smoking, drinking, gambling. Is that sufficient consideration, is it legally sufficient consideration for the nephew's quid pro quo? The uncle wanted to pay $5,000, he asked his nephew not to drink, smoke, or gamble, uh, and then of course the, the uncle died and the estate doesn't want to give the money to the nephew. And the nephew argued that I did what I was supposed to do and the trustee of the estate argued that's not really consideration. That boy should have not drunk, smoked, or gambled anyway. And so he really didn't give anything to his uncle in, in return. And the court held that giving up those legal rights to drink, smoke, uh, gamble, etc., those were in fact legal rights that he gave up and that was sufficient, legally sufficient consideration. Second case is Batsakis versus Dematsis. And that's a case that demonstrates the fact that certain things of themselves will be determined to be legally sufficient and it demonstrates the court's dislike of asking the adequacy question. If there is a determination of legal sufficiency, courts tend to stop right there. And here we had a very disparate values, significantly disparate values, in the amount promised in dollars as in return for, I believe it was Greek drachmas, and it was a problem of inflation around World War II, and the values were changed very significantly. Uh, but for example, if, uh, let me give another example in today's terms. If I promise to give you $10,000 after my next uh, month's payment for $100 today, that would look fishy. But what if I needed $100 in five minutes to pay a fine and if I pay that fine, I won't be uh, found uh, in violation and have to pay an extra fine of $15,000. I might need that $100 right now so badly that I'm willing to pay for it. If I offered you $100 for a Pepsi, that does not look very good. But what if I'm in the desert and there's no other source of liquid and I've been out in the desert for three days? 
$100 for a Pepsi might actually be a pretty good deal from my end. And so that's why courts look at sufficiency. And unless there is a huge disparity in, in values of each side, and possibly some other indicia of a problem, like it looks more like a gift, courts do not like to get into adequacy. And the Pitsakis case is an excellent example of that very point. Um, and when we get to Schnell, it goes to the other side, where there is a, a penny offered for a certain contractual relationship involving a will. And what is going on is the person who made the promise has a moral obligation, not really a legal one. And so what he was trying to do in return for a penny uh, did not match up. And the court did look into the adequacy question, decided that the values were too disparate, and this was a gift or this was anything but a true contract. And so Schnell is the opposite of Patsakis because Schnell goes as far as finding uh, a, a penny for what's really a moral obligation, legally, in, not legally insufficient, legally inadequate um, consideration. Figi versus Beam in the last case, uh, the rule in that case on the bottom of 165, middle of page 166 is as follows. If you have a good faith belief that you have a legal claim and you give it up for consideration, that's fine. So we had a woman who thought that somebody might have been the father of her child and rather than sue him, he agreed to pay her a certain amount of money for costs and whatnot. And later it turns out that the child may not have been his and he didn't want to have to pay any further. Uh, however, this woman honestly believed that she had a claim against him for child support or paternity, and she was unaware of the true facts. So she had an honest belief, and she gave up her ability to sue him in paternity based on his agreement to pay. And so in that particular case, that giving up of her legal right to sue because it was steeped in good faith was definitely legally sufficient consideration. So again, uh, what we cover today are different forms of consideration, including money, including services, including giving up legal rights. We talked about at least one consideration substitute, which is the detrimental reliance facet where an option contract may be created. We talked about legal sufficiency and legal adequacy. Remember, the courts will always look at the first, and only if things don't look quite copacetic will courts look into the second, whether or not the the balance uh, between the values is legally inadequate. Okay, thank you.